All righty, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Horror Mine, the home for all things horror. This is Gems of Horror, the show where I break down and discuss, in my opinion, the very best films of the horror movie genre. In last week's episode, one viewer asked if I could break down the South Korean thriller film, I Saw the Devil. Why? Yes. Yes, I can, Lindy May. Ladies and gentlemen, I Saw the Devil is an absolutely brutal revenge film with a twist. When the fiancé of a South Korean special agent gets brutally murdered, he decides to go on a vigilante revenge quest and hunt the killer down. However, when he finally catches the killer, he brutalizes him, then lets him go. Wait, what? No, no, I know what you're thinking. He proceeds to place a tracker on him and hunts him down to brutalize and torture him throughout the entire film. Ladies and gentlemen, this is without a doubt one of the most brutal and, dare I say, exciting horror films I have ever seen. This is an amazing film full of tense and disturbing sequences that are carried by the film's brilliant leads. This is also a very bloody movie that doesn't shy away from the awesome gore, so if you're into that stuff like I am, well, you're in for a treat. Ladies and gents, if you enjoy the video, feel free to subscribe and join a community of fellow horror fans who love to talk about movies. We are so close to hitting 100 subscribers, and I thank each and every one of you for the support. If you have a request or suggestion for a horror movie you'd like to see me break down and discuss, let me know in the comments down below. But without further ado, let's talk horror movies! Our movie begins with a first-person view of an ominous yet slightly romantic drive down a dark and snowy road. We see a young woman who appears to be stranded in her vehicle on the side of the road waiting on a tow truck. We see the man who was driving the vehicle in the earlier shot approach the woman's vehicle and offer to help her change her tire. She advises him that she already called for a tow truck, but he insists on taking a look. We see that the young woman, Ju Yong, is talking to her fiancé and main protagonist, NIS Special Agent Kim Soo Hyun. Agent Soo is portrayed by one of my favorite South Korean actors, Lee Byung Hun. Agent Soo appears to be preparing with other special agents for an unknown mission, and we find out that he is once again working on his fiancé's birthday. Ju Yeon asks Agent Su to sing her a song over the phone in a sweet scene that quickly becomes tragic because of what's about to go down. The man advises Ju Yong that her vehicle is completely sunk in the snow, but she assures him she'll be fine waiting for the tow truck and rolls up her window. In the first of this film's many brutal scenes, the man proceeds to smash his way into the vehicle with a hammer. Trapped by her surroundings and unable to escape, Ju Yeon is brutally murdered by the man with the hammer. He then drags her body away and leaves a trail of blood through the snow. The film's main antagonist is brilliantly portrayed by another one of my favorite South Korean actors, Choi Min Sik. This man's acting is on another level, ladies and gents. Within the first scene of the movie, I absolutely hated this character. While murdering his helpless victim, he displayed so much hate and anger while delivering that final blow, and seeing that made me sick to my stomach. Now, I never noticed prior to making this video, but in the opening shot of the film, you can actually see a police patrol vehicle passing Jenk's school bus, which absolutely sucks to know that help was so close, yet so far. We then see that all those hammer shots to the head did not actually kill Ju Yan, as she wakes up in the killer's lair, wrapped in a clear body bag. With the little strength she has left, she pleads with the man not to kill her and tells him that she is pregnant. The killer, unfazed with this revelation and her pleas to live, proceeds to completely dismember her body in a very disturbing scene. While chopping off her body parts, Ju Yan's engagement ring falls into a drainage ditch, the man then proceeds to clean up shop after a hard day of work. The search for Ju Yan's body swiftly begins as a piece of her ear is discovered by a young boy in a field. Her severed head is discovered by the police, and complete chaos unfolds at the scene. So much damn chaos that the guy holding her head trips and her head rolls on the ground right in front of Agent Su. Seriously, man? This guy had one job. Take the severed head from point A to point B without accidentally dropping the head in front of her loved ones. Completely shocked and horrified, Agent Su breaks down into tears. At Ju Yan's funeral, Agent Su, once again, breaks down into tears. He does that a lot in this movie. I would too. It's a pretty sad movie. He makes a promise to his late fiance that he will find her killer and make him pay for her pain. 
We then see Agent Sue speak to a supervisor and request for only two weeks to quote unquote grieve. Now, if this ever happened to me, I don't even know if I'd ever go back to work. I don't think anyone could ever truly grieve and properly recover from something like this. Agent Sue then gets his hands on a small capture tracker device that his co-worker snuck out of the office and assures him that nothing will go wrong. He is then given the profiles of four possible suspects by Ju Yan's father, Chief Jang, who has been a part of the local police department for over 30 years. With the list of possible suspects, the true hunt for the killer begins. We see our first suspect currently engaged in an aggressive masturbating session that gets quickly interrupted by Agent Sue. Agent Sue proceeds to put the beat down on this man before asking him if he knows anything about his fiance's murder. Agent Sue believes the man had nothing to do with the murder, but proceeds to smash his balls with a wrench anyways before leaving. This man is not playing around. In the next scene, we see the unnamed suspect in the hospital. He was so traumatized by the beatdown that he confesses to two murders he did commit some time back. He definitely got what he deserved. Agent Sue finds and puts the beat down on the second suspect, but ultimately scratches him off the list. We then see a young woman stranded and alone at a bus stop. Thanks to absolutely horrible luck, the real killer pulls up in his school van and asks the woman if she needs a ride. She is reluctant at first, but eventually agrees to let him give her a ride. During the ride, however, the woman tries to make small conversation with the man, but he ignores her. He proceeds to beat her over the head with a pipe, then decapitates her with a guillotine. He's got a little style. I'll give him that. Agent Sue pays a visit to the killer's parents, disguised as a life insurance agent, and we find out his name is Jang Kyung Chol. We also find out that Jang has a son, and to no surprise, Jang is a deadbeat dad who doesn't care about his family. Jang's son reveals where Jang lives to Agent Sue. Agent Sue then discovers Jang's lair and finds several women's handbags, undergarments, and clothing, confirming that Jang is the killer he is looking for. He also finds Jang's killing room, and in it, his fiancé's engagement ring wedged between the drainage pipe. He proceeds to burst into tears for the third time. Man, I feel for the guy. We now see that Jang Kyung Chol's day job is a driver driving around kids in his school van. This is absolutely sick. However, serial killers often attempt to blend in as much as possible. They will often find ways to engage with the community in order to seem normal and blend in. Something I learned a few years back when learning about serial killers such as John Wayne Gacy and Ted Bundy. The police are now also looking for Jang. They show up to the school and ask one of the employees to call him back. The school attempts to call Jang on his cell phone and by the look on his face, he knows that he is absolutely screwed. Unfortunately, he has one more passenger inside of his van. At this point, I believe that Jang knows he's going to get caught and decides to impose his will on one last victim. Just as he is about to sexually assault the young girl, he is confronted by Agent Sue. An absolute thrilling fight ensues between the two, although pretty one-sided as Jang gets his ass beat the entirety of the fight. Jang attempts to make a run for it, but his escape is foiled by an absolutely badass kick courtesy of Agent Sue. Agent Sue wraps his head around a plastic bag and proceeds to smash Jank's face into a rock several times. He picks up the rock and just as it appears he is about to crush Jank's head, he drops the rock. Lee Byung Hun's brilliant acting is in full effect here. We can see his desire to kill this man and end his life. He has caught his lover's murderer and can exact judgment and vengeance all in this one moment. However, a quick death is not enough for such a deranged and evil man. He forces down the tracker into Jang's mouth and then breaks his arm. Jang wakes up in what could have been his grave and is shocked to find an envelope full of money sitting on his chest. Serial killer Jang has now become Hitchhiker Jang as he attempts to hitch a ride from cars passing by. By sheer luck, or unluck, he manages to catch a taxi in the middle of nowhere. The taxi driver already has a passenger in the back, but offers Jang a ride and the passenger states he does not mind the company. Jang automatically notices that something is wrong when he sees that the picture on the taxi driver's license 
does not match the driver. He also notices that the rear passenger is glaring at him. In his only moment of badassery, Jang proceeds to brutally murder both the driver and the passenger by stabbing them each multiple times with a small knife. The vehicle crashes, and Jang discovers that the two had murdered the real taxi driver and stuffed his body in the trunk, and hilariously calls them crazy bastards. Jang, now wearing a ridiculous looking soccer outfit, drives to a local clinic to get fixed up. Unable to contain his sick ways for even a minute, he then proceeds to sexually assault a nurse. Agent Su once again comes to the rescue and smacks Jang in the face with a fire extinguisher. Jang, shocked and terrified, unsuccessfully attempts to fight back. He gets the absolute shit beat out of him once again. Agent Su then proceeds to cut his Achilles tendon with a scalpel. Ouch. He absolutely deserves it, but that was very painful to watch. Agent Su tells Jang that this is just the beginning and that his nightmare is only getting worse. <laughs> The film does such a good job in making me think what I would do in this situation. Jang being beat and tortured is absolutely what he deserves, and if it were me, I probably would have never thought to do what Agent Su is doing. I probably would have killed Jang the first chance I got. It also does raise the question of when does a person like Jang receive enough punishment? I don't know guys, but I do like when my horror movies get the old noggin thinking. We then see Hitchhiker Jang attempt to get a ride from his possible next victim. However, in a surprisingly funny moment, the freaking military rolls up on Jang and apparently gave him a ride to his next destination. Now, just when you thought this movie couldn't get any darker, we get introduced to our next character, Jang's longtime friend and fellow serial killer, Taeju. Taeju is different from Jang in that he is a freaking cannibal. We'll just call him. Cannibal Fatso. Agent Su gets a phone call from Chief Jang, who suggests that maybe he should stop chasing Jang Kyung Chul. Chief Jang states that the police believe he is the one chasing the killer. Really? Chief Jang's other daughter, Si Yan, also asks Agent Su to stop hunting Jang, saying that this will not bring Ju Yan back. We see Jang, Cannibal Fatso, and his girlfriend all having dinner where Cannibal Fatso is devouring a plate of human flesh. He states that once you try human flesh, you will never go back. Agent Sue is able to listen in on the perfectly normal dinner conversation thanks to the tracker. We hear Cannibal Fatso tell Jang that he has created a monster, a monster who enjoys the hunt and torturing his prey. Cannibal Fatso is in the process of prepping his next meal when he is confronted by Agent Sue. He stares down Agent Sue while holding a sharp blade. And just when I thought I was about to see a truly awesome fight, Cannibal Fatso gets his ass handed to him. It becomes clear that neither Cannibal Fatso nor Jang can match Agent Su in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Jang hears the commotion going on downstairs and arms himself with a double-barreled shotgun off the wall. An absolutely thrilling and intense action sequence goes down inside the house between everyone involved. Which, of course, ends with Agent Su brutalizing Jang once again. He basses Jang's skull in with a metal pipe so much that I'm surprised he didn't die right then and there. Agent Su takes Jang to the hospital to be treated. Jang overhears a conversation between the two agents where he finds out how Agent Su has been tracking him the entire time. Jang wakes up in a dark tunnel and starts talking directly to Agent Su. He tells him that his fiancée was pregnant and begged for her life before he killed her. He taunts Agent Su and tells him that he should have stayed within close range while tracking him. He manages to get rid of his tracker and loses Agent Su's tail on him. The police then receive a call from Jang Kyung Chol, who says that he is going to turn himself in. Agent Su heads to the hospital where Cannibal Fatso is being treated to ask him where Jang could possibly be. We also see that Cannibal Fatso's girlfriend is still knocked out. She only got punched like one time. Come on, man! We find out from Cannibal Fatso that Jang plans on killing Chief Jang and his remaining daughter, then plans to turn himself in. He then mocks him and begins to make fun of Ju Yan. Agent Su then starts to tear Cannibal Fatso's mouth wide open, and we finally found out how Joker got these scars. Agent Su as well as Captain O and his squad all attempt to rush over to Chief Jang's house, but it is too late. Jang Kyung Chul makes it to the Chief's residence first. 
where he brutalizes him with a dumbbell. The police soon discover Su Yan's dead body in an alleyway soon after. Jang calls and speaks to Agent Su and asks him who he really thinks won. A bloody Jang attempts to turn himself in in the middle of a busy intersection. The police rush in and attempt to detain Jang. However, in a desperate last effort, Agent Su manages to grab a hold of Jang before the police and drives off. In the final scene of the film, we see Jang hogtied underneath his own guillotine. A brilliant verbal exchange between both parties ensues. Agent Su asks Jang if he regrets and if he is sorry for all that he's done. Agent Su tells Jang that he will die soon enough, but only when he is at his most vulnerable. Jang proceeds to apologize and begs Agent Su to spare him. He asks Jang if he is scared. However, Jang reveals that he is truly unfazed by everything Agent Su has done. He states that he is one because he has taken everything he loves away from him, and that there is nothing that can be taken from him. In this moment, I feel that Agent Su realizes that he is truly lost. He realizes that it is impossible to exact pain and revenge on true evil. Agent Su walks away from the house as we see Jang Kyung Chul's parents and son pull up to the house. We see that Agent Su has tied the guillotine to the door and that it is only being held up from falling by Jang's teeth. Unknowingly, Jang's parents and son attempt to open the door. Jang cries and pleads with his family not to open the door. The family manage to open the door and the guillotine chops off Jang's head in full view of his son and parents. By the sound of his voice, I felt that this was the only thing Agent Su could do to Jang to make him feel vulnerable before his death. As horrible as this was for Jang's family, we could see that he did not want his family to see him in this state and did not want them to witness his inevitable death. The last thing Agent Su hears are the cries of pain and agony of Jang Kyung Chul's family as they witness his horrible death. In the film's final shot, Agent Su, absolutely broken, walks away from the house and breaks down in uncontrollable tears as the film cuts to black. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was I Saw the Devil. Guys, by the end, this film absolutely broke me. The final scene where Agent Su breaks down into uncontrollable tears and walks away, that was actually me. In all seriousness, as I previously said, this movie made me ask myself all sorts of questions. What would I have done in this situation? This is a situation that I hope no one ever has to find themselves in, but this is a dark and cruel world, ladies and gents, and things like this are bound to happen. By the end, I truly felt that Jang Kyun Chul was right. Although he ended up dying, he really did win. He was able to hurt and murder everyone that Agent Su cared about. Jang did not care whether he got captured or died. He imposed his will on everyone he wanted and ultimately ended up breaking Agent Su and me. Should Agent Su have killed Jang the first time he caught him? Yeah, I really think so. Not only would he have gotten the satisfaction of killing Jang, but he could have avoided the death count that Jang left in his wake of being chased. This proves that revenge is never the answer, and if someone chooses to go down the path of vengeance, how much is truly enough? At that point, can we truly determine and gauge how our revenge measures up to the original pain we felt and experienced? I really don't know. Ladies and gentlemen, I truly hope that you all enjoyed this video. I love talking about horror movies, and I hope that you guys enjoy hearing me talk about them. I cannot wait to see y'all right back here in the Horror Mine. Y'all stick around.